Hello, I'm JW. Today we're going to have a look at loop impedance and uh, what happens when you short out the mains and things go bang. Now impedance can be thought of as uh, resistance. Impedance is measured in ohms, just the same as resistance, and the same kind of calculations that can be used. So uh, for the ohms law type of thing you've got the volts, current and resistance. And as we've seen in a previous video, if you know any two of these things, you can calculate the third value. So if you know the voltage and the resistance, or the impedance in this case, dividing one by the other, that will give you the current, which will flow through that particular circuit. And uh, although impedance is measured in ohms, and in most cases you can use this, it's worth remembering that this is not just a resistive element. It can involve inductance and capacitance as well, particularly when transformers and things are involved. But uh, for most smaller installations, you can uh, just consider it as a resistance there, and these uh, types of calculations are still valid. Now, for any given electricity supply, it's going to originate at some sort of a transformer, typically outside in the road or on a stick at the end of the drive or whatever. And this will be what's uh, converting the incoming much higher voltage, typically, say, 11,000 volts or more, down to the 230 volts that you would normally use within your house. And there's going to be a length of wires coming from the transformer to your house. There's going to be some sort of incoming fuse where it comes into the building. And you're also going to have other equipment here, such as an electricity meter. And then you're going to have your consumer unit with fuses and devices and circuits extending on into the building. But if we can just consider for the moment the terminals we've got here. And uh, these, of course, can be just marked up here as line and neutral. Now, of course, there's also going to be an earth connection as well. So we'll just draw that in at the bottom here. Let's go to a door as a TNS supply. So you've got a separate earth conductor going back to the transformer. And that the transformer is always going to be connected to the neutral in there. Of course, it might be connected here if it was the uh, TNCS type of supply, but in any event, there's certainly going to be an earth connection coming in. Now, when it talks about the loop impedance, what we're talking about is a loop between wherever a fault occurs. So there might be, say, a fault here between line and earth. And then it's the entire loop of the whole circuit here involving the transformer and any kind of wiring, the fuse, electricity meter. And then if it was inside the building, the circuit wiring and everything else. And the question then is how much current will actually flow through all of this in the event that these two wires here are shorted together due to a fault. Now normally of course you wouldn't be doing this, but if some kind of problem occurred then this is what is actually going to be happening. So the loop then is the entirety of this, so it's all the way from the transformer here through the wiring and the fuse and electricity meter and what else you've got through the fault has occurred and then along by the returning on the earth conductor here and all the way back to the transformer. So what we need to find out is essentially the resistance or impedance of this entire circuit here and then simply by dividing voltage divided by the impedance there we can establish the sort of current which will flow in the event of a fault. And it's important to know this because we need to make sure that uh, if this does occur the current that flows here is sufficient so it can actually blow the fuse here and disconnect before the cables and things melt or set on fire. Now for this particular impedance here, impedance has the symbol Z. And this is what's called the external loop impedance because bearing in mind this is where the wires are coming into your building. So all of this is external to the installation or outside. And that's given the symbol ZE. So E for external, fairly obviously. And in a real situation, if this occurred at the installation origin here, where the wires come into the building, then of course that is the value which would determine the current that flows. However, in a real installation, you're going to have additional things here. You're going to have your consumer unit and additional circuit breakers and fuses inside. And then of course your wiring going off to all kinds of circuits and things elsewhere in the building. So in those cases, you would have to include the impedance of all of that stuff as well. And that uh, also has the symbol Z. But because it's the entire system, so the external part and the circuit breakers things and all the circuit wiring and everything else, it has the symbol ZS. 
so that's the impedance of the entire system. So that's just the external part. And then this part is the entire system, which includes all of your circuits and everything else. Now, in terms of actually measuring this, fairly straightforward. You can buy uh, various bits of equipment which you just simply connect between the appropriate wires, press a button, and it will give you some kind of reading as to what this might actually be. And uh, there's several ways of achieving that. I'm not going to go into that in any detail in this video. We may have a look at that at a later date. But uh, suffice to say, there's a couple of possible options, one of which is to apply a certain amount of load on the end here, so a known current will flow. And because you're applying a current flowing through basically a resistance, the voltage here will drop. And uh, by combining the voltage drop at this point and the resistance and the current that's flowing, you can then calculate the uh, estimate of what the total impedance of the system is. And another method is actually to inject a current into this and again measure what kind of uh, voltage drop whatever you get. So uh, not something you generally have to be concerned with because if you've got the actual device it's a question of just connecting it to the terminals and pressing the button. But uh, essentially that's how it's going to do it either by putting a current in or applying a known load to the end and seeing what kind of voltage drop actually occurs. The other thing to make sure that there is that if you are going to do that you must use a specific device intended to measure this you cannot take a multimeter and stick it to resistance range and connect it here, because if you do, the multimeter will blow up in a ball of flames and be destroyed. So uh, this has to be done with a specific piece of equipment designed for the purpose. And um, that can either be a separate item or more usually it's part of one of those multi-function testing devices. Now typical values for the external loop impedance depend on the type of supply that you've actually got. So we've seen these in a previous video, so I won't go over those in too much detail here, but there are essentially three main types used in the UK. You've got TNS, which is where the earth conductor from the transformer is a separate wire, hence the S here. So you've got your three wires coming in, line, neutral, and earth. And in this case, a typical impedance between the line and earth would be anything up to around 0.8 ohms. Again, that's a kind of a maximum value. It could easily be considerably less than that, but uh, anything up to that would be considered perfectly normal and acceptable. And the other most common type is the TNCS system. And this is usually where you have a two core cable from the supply, so just the line in neutral. And then the earth is actually combined with the neutral in that, so when it enters the building, your earth and neutral terminals are effectively connected to the same conductor within the cable. Of this type of system, a typical maximum is around 0.35 ohms, so quite a bit less than the TNS system. And on this one, you'll also find that if you measure between, say, line and neutral and line and earth, you'll find that the value is generally the same, simply because it's, of course, the same piece of wire you're measuring. It's just the fact that there's two terminals at the end. Of course, they're both connected to the same cable immediately as it leaves the building. And the third system, which is somewhat less common, is the TT system. And this is where you don't actually have an earth connection directly back to the transformer. It relies on an earth electrode in the ground. So the return path in that case is actually through the general mass of the ground. And in this case, the resistance can be anything up to 100 ohms or more. In theory, you could get one in the region of sort of 21 ohms, which is partly due to how the uh, things are installed at the substation. But in the real world, you're probably looking in the region of anything up to 100 ohms or so. Anything above 100 ohms is generally requiring some investigation, and certainly if it was in the 200-300 ohms range, then that would generally not be considered acceptable. Now, for any given voltage, and in the UK that's going to be in the region of 230 volts, if we actually had supplies with these uh, external loop impedances, we can calculate what the current would be in the event of a short-circuit fault between line and earth. And it's simply the voltage divided by the impedance. So in this case, 230 divided by 0.8 would result in a current of around 287 amps. For this one, 230 divided by 0.35 would be around 657 amps. And then for the TT supply, it's going to be much, much smaller. So 230, we'll use the 21 ohm value here. So 230 divided by 21 would give us the total current flowing of 11 amps.
So why are these actually particularly important and why would we really care? Well, the answer is that in any kind of circuit, you're going to have a protective device, typically a fuse or circuit breaker or something. And in order for that circuit breaker fuse to actually trip when there's a short circuit fault, it needs a certain amount of current to flow through it. Now, if we had a look on this page here, if we had a circuit breaker or MCB as they're currently called, and say this was a 32 amp, and it was a type B, which again is by far the most common, then for this to reliably trip near instantaneously, then we need a current to flow through this in the region of five times its rated current. So in the case of this particular one, that will be simply five times 32, which of course is 160. So if 160 amps is suddenly shoved through this circuit breaker, it's going to pretty much trip off instantaneously, disconnecting the fault, and of course stopping the cables and things melting and setting on fire. And of course that's the whole point of having the thing there in the first place. So if you have a look over here, in all the cases here we've got, even at the uh, lower count on the 287, it's clearly a lot more than the 160, so that's absolutely fine. And again, 657 is obviously massively more than the 160, so no problem there. But on the TT supply, unfortunately the current available is only 11 amps. Pretty obviously if you put 11 amps through a 30 amp circuit breaker, nothing will happen. So uh, in this case you're going to need an additional device, which is generally an RCD or one of those old uh, voltage operated uh, leakage devices, to disconnect in the event of fault to ground. And this is why they're actually essential to use on the TT supply, because even with a complete short circuit between line and earth, you're only going to get something like 11 amps flowing, and in the real world it could be considerably less. Bearing in mind it could be anything up to 100 ohms there, so you might only get like 2 or 3 amps flowing, which again is uh, pretty much useless for any circuit breaker. So that's with a uh, Type B there, and again that uh, typically runs around 5 times the current rating to trip. However, in the case of other types, there are, for example, a Type C. Type C requires 10 times the current rating to trip, so in this case it would be 320 amps. Now, have a look on the fuse page. Well, with the TNCS supply, again, short circuit current is going to be around the 657 amps range, so again, massively more than 320, not a problem. But on the TNS supply with the impedance of 0.8, you're only going to get about 287 amps, which as you see there is considerably less than the 320 needed to trip the 32 amp type C reliably. So in this case, uh, you wouldn't actually be able to use a 32 amp type C on this type of supply, simply the fact that the fault current is not large enough to actually trip the device reliably. If you put 287 amps through there, it'll probably trip, but it's going to take somewhat longer, and therefore the uh, tripping time is likely to be more than the required minimum. Typical is uh, around 0.4 seconds, it can be larger in some cases. And of course there is a Type D as well, which requires 20 times the current, and in the case of that one, you would need 640 amps if it was a Type D. And as you can see there, that's way off. Clearly 287 is massively less than 640, so pretty obviously not going to work. 657 is just within, so 640 and you've got 657. But again, uh, careful consideration has to be given to using Type Ds there, certainly of high ratings. Simply the fact that uh, the total available current in many cases is not going to be sufficient to trip the device within the required time. And something else to consider here as well, we're not this is just talking about the external impedance, so literally the supply as it comes into the building. But in a real situation with circuits, it's not just the external impedance, you also have to add on any impedance for the circuit wiring itself. So it's uh, 0.8 in this case, plus whatever the resistance of the cabling is. And if you've got particularly long circuits, that can add quite a significant amount to these. And again, reducing the available current here in the end of a fault even further. So let's look at loop impedance. And it's important to know this for any particular installation, as uh, the loop impedance, as we've seen there, determines the current which will flow in the event of a fault, such as a short circuit between line and neutral, or between line and earth. And the current which flows there does need to be known as well, because that determines how quickly the fuse or circuit breaker will disconnect.
and there are limits for that, typically around 0.4 seconds for the majority of circuits. And if the uh, loop impedance is too high, and therefore the current which flows is not large enough, then the device may not disconnect in that time, or in extreme circumstances may not disconnect at all. And you can of course measure this using a device, either a separate uh, standalone piece of equipment, or more likely is built into a multi-function tester. And generally it's just a question of connecting that to the supply and pressing a button. And there's not really much to see inside of those, because of course they're all electronic now, so uh, very little to see. But next time we'll have a look at a loop impedance tester of a different type. And it's this one here. And as you can see, this of course is not electronic in the slightest. And this is a much older device. It comes in this uh, substantial wooden box, so uh, we'll uh, see how this works in a later video. And also uh, open it up and look inside. But uh, until then, thanks for watching.